Thousands of migrant workers come to Ontario every year to help bring in the bounty of our fields and greenhouses. They come under Canada's temporary foreign worker program, but don't always find what they expected or were promised. Tonight, right after this program, TVO airs the world broadcast premiere of Migrant Dreams. It's a documentary that looks at the lives of some of these workers. And for a close-up view of the issue, we welcome Min Suk Lee, the writer, director, and producer of Migrant Dreams. Faye Faraday, labor and human rights lawyer and visiting professor at the Osgoode Hall Law School. And Jen Fenning, director of human resources, operations, and marketing at Fenning's Organic Farms in New Hamburg, Ontario. And it's great to have the three of you around our table today for this discussion on a very timely topic. I want to start by playing a clip of your documentary, which we're going to show, obviously, it's in entirety very soon. But just to set up our discussion, why don't we show 48 seconds of what you've been working on for the last many years. Roll clip, please. You have to do it. It's either you do it or you go back to Jamaica. I have a list of 23 workers. They're really afraid. There's an excursion happening. You've told them that you're concerned about the health and safety issue. What do they do? They said to you that there's no danger. It's chemical, but it's harmless. Everybody keep their mouth closed. Does Canada need temporary foreign workers? I think the quality of the uh, migrant people that are being brought over is something that is a big issue. Who are these people? Let's start with the filmmaker. You have chosen to set this documentary in the southwestern Ontario town of Leamington, and I wonder how come? Leamington, Ontario is ground zero for the Temporary Foreign Worker Program in Canada. There are over 7,000 migrant workers who work largely in agriculture and in food production in Leamington. And the economy there, the industries, the bosses and the companies have benefited. They've maximized profit because they can rely on a pool of workers who are uh, consistently available. Fr frankly, they are unfree workers because they're tied to the employers when they come into the country. The migrant labor program ties workers to one boss. And if they encounter any issues in workplace conditions or how they're treated uh, on the farms or living conditions, automatically the general response is deportation. So you have a group of workers who are pliable, who are exploitable, and uh, they are very affordable. You no, know, the film clearly shows how precarious their existence is, which is what surprised me so much that you've got, you managed to get any of them to talk to you uh, on camera. Uh, how did you manage to do that? I think that uh, migrant workers themselves are not vulnerable because they're essentially vulnerable people. The program structures migrant workers as vulnerable, and the program is designed to silence workers' advocacy and speaking out for themselves. Because if you speak out, if you complain about how you are treated on the farm, uh, oftentimes it's deportation and you're out on the next plane back home. My work as a filmmaker is about building relationships. And I think documentary is very much about relationships on film. So they trusted you? They trusted me because they trusted the people who introduced me to them. I was working alongside Justice for Migrant Workers, who are an activist volunteer group who do work in support and in solidarity with migrant workers. And because I was introduced to the workers with people who they trusted, then I was able to build on that. But the production itself took almost three years. Hmm. And during that time, that trust is built each time you're filming. How did you manage to convince them that, yes, it's OK and in your interest to talk to me and you won't be adversely affected as a result? I don't think I could make empty promises, but I think workers are very much aware of the power of film and the power of media. And they also believed in the power of Canadian viewers who once they know what is happening, cannot say they didn't know, and would take action. So workers were very much trusting not just of me, but of the, the power of film and the idea that maybe Canadians don't know what's happening in our own backyards. Mm. Possibly the, the stories of how migrant workers have been, oh, since the mid-1960s, treated as disposable workers. These stories are not coming out into the mainstream, and they, they believed that the film could be a vehicle for speaking about their truths and realities. In which case, Faith, uh, let's pick up the story from there. What makes Canada a prime destination for these kinds of workers? These, uh, I mean, this is a, a global issue. It has to do with um, inequalities, structural inequalities between North and South. And Canada is taking advantage of that, right? They've, we've created um, temporary labor migration programs that 
are designed to bring workers here um, from conditions that are uh, extremely impoverished um, and bring them here, as, as Min Suk said, under terms that make them very exploitable labor, very cheap labor. So the tied work permits, the restrictions on their, their workforce mobility, the fact that they don't get to negotiate their, their wages, that they're um, set to, at minimum wage, um, it produces uh, uh, a relationship where workers can be highly exploited, but they're coming from uh, countries where they don't have the opportunity um, for sustainable economies at home. Hmm. Um, so it, it, Canada is absolutely profiting from its role in that global system. Jane, you are the voice of business at this table. Here we go. Tell me about your business. Uh, so we're a farm, vegetable farm. Uh, we employ about uh, 25, this year 25 migrant workers from Jamaica. Um, under the Seasonal Agricultural Worker Program. That represents roughly 20% of our total workforce. So we have about 140 people at our peak this season, and um, 25 of them, as I said, are from Jamaica. And you employ them as opposed to people who have been born and raised in Canada because? They have the skills. They work alongside us as if it's their own farm. Um, we, we started using the program um, in 2005. We had, up until that point, uh, my family's farmed the land that we're on since 1981, and up until that point, as we grew and, and um, needed more help in the field and that, hired students, hired um, temporary foreign workers, but from uh, Europe. Hmm. Um, because, you know, a friend of a friend knew somebody who was finished their sort of high school level and wanted to travel and would come over for the season, so one or two uh, people a year. Can you get come Canadians over to do and, these jobs? Yes. Um, only 20% of our workforce is um, under the Seasonal Agricultural Worker Program. Hmm. Okay. So out of the 140, the rest of them, we have a, a large number that are first generation Indian immigrants. Um, so they are permanent residents or citizens. Um, we have, uh, the, at, the rest of them are various backgrounds, genetically speaking. Um, we have a couple people who came to Canada as refugees mm -hmm. from Laos, from El Salvador. Um, Let me focus in on the ones from Jamaica who you started telling us about. How, yeah. how many again? 25. 25. Yeah. Uh, can you gauge how happy they are working for you? Well, um, they say they're happy. <laughs> of course, I'm their employer. You know, that it, it inherently there's an imbalance in the power. And that's a, something I think that not, it isn't thought of enough. As an employer, you have to remember that even when you have goodwill and you want to support your workers, there is inherently a, a, a power imbalance. Sure, but no I asked where. I asked because I'm I'm told that they had complained about previous places that they had worked at, saying they were mistreated. Yeah, it's it. They say they're very happy with us. And um, just the other day, we had somebody visiting, touring the farm, and and I left them to speak with our workers for a few minutes, and I went away to find somebody else, and came back, and and uh, the person who was visiting said. They're very defensive of you. <laughs> so to me, if, if they are speaking that way when I'm not present, that reassures me that they are in fact happy. Um, the fact that they come back every year could be seen as um, a sign that they're happy, except that, as you know, um, if we request them, their only option is to say no, and then they stay home. Hmm. Um, OK, in which case, Minsook, let's, let's continue to tell the story here. Uh, you tell a story in the documentary, but you obviously can't tell every story of what's happening in the province of Ontario in this area. Would you, would you agree that there are some people who are doing it okay? Of there course, are some... Steve. I, okay. I don't think that you can blanket um, generalize about all bosses. Of course, there's going to be good bosses, but there's absolutely uh, going to be bad bosses. I think the problem we have with the program is that there's no monitoring, there's no regulation, and there's a complete lack of enforcement of rules. So for example, the practice of recruitment in Ontario is widespread. Hmm. Workers in the Temporary Foreign Worker Program have paid uh, fees as high as $14,000 to private recruiters for the privilege of, of doing minimum wage jobs mm -hmm. in Ontario, picking worms and picking fruit. Yeah. 
who's enforcing how recruiters operate, who's licensing them, who's regulating them. That's not happening. Can well, I ask, let me just uh, sure. let me ask Jen, are you aware of how the workers who are migrant workers have come to you, whether they've had to go through any of those? Well, soft workers don't pay recruitment fees. Yeah. They're different. That's, it, there okay. is, yeah. and that is one of the things that I would say um, makes the SOP better than the, the rest of the streams. It, it, mm -hmm. It's a small difference. It, it's not a, it doesn't fix everything. Mm -hmm. under, um, under the SOP, it's government to government. SOP recruiting. standing for? The Seasonal Agricultural Worker Program. So that's the program with um, uh, Mexico and the Caribbean uh, states. And it's the um, governments in those home countries that do the recruiting. So that's a different system. But outside of that, for workers who are coming from any other country under the Temporary Foreign Worker Program, it is this private recruitment that Min Sook's talking about. And those workers are um, paying thousands of dollars. They're paying the application fees that the employers are supposed, supposed to pay. Mm -hmm. And I've also spoken to workers who've had to be, they've been forced to pay their employer's legal fees as well. So mm -hmm. they come here with this massive debt before they even start their first day of work. And with the tied work permits, they're essentially held in debt bondage for the entirety of their their work term. And Minsook, as you've looked at it, how dependent is the economy of this province on the people we're talking about right now? Oh, very much so. And I think when we, lo we look at this program, I don't think it's useful to talk about one bad apple. We actually have to see the program and say the cart is rotten. It's not a rotten apple, it's a rotten cart. Workers are coming into a program which structurally defines them as vulnerable. Mm -hmm. They have, a, there's a disproportionate power imbalance between the boss and the worker. If the workers are tied to their employer, with these tied work permits, they have no ability to say, no, I'm not going to spray those pesticides without proper protection mm -hmm. or without proper training. This is an unsafe work condition. No, 30 of us are not going to live in one housing, you know, in one little house. That's not acceptable. The uh, ability, the freedom for workers to speak about their labor and human rights is muzzled by the design of the program. So the, the program virtually invites abuse. But and I it... think that's, that's the issue. Of, there are good employers. There are conscientious bosses who want to uh, treat workers fairly, but the program itself allows for abuse and exploitation. And so there will, when workplace abuses happen, they're not random, they are chronic, and they are quite regular occurrences. I wonder if it's, it's even possible that some of the employers don't even know the circumstances under which the migrant uh, workers came here. I, they no. know. The employers, they do know. The employers know. They have to go through quite a detailed um, application process to bring workers uh, to Canada, to be authorized to bring workers to Canada under this program. But the program really does, uh, in a very predictable way, um, allow for exploitation. And it does happen frequently. It's actually the norm. When Ontario's uh, Ministry of Labour did some blitzes out uh, into uh, areas of agriculture, construction, and restaurants where they knew temporary foreign workers were employed, they found that between 54 and 62 percent of employers were not complying with the minimum laws. Right? When they did a broader sweep uh, through other industries... Sorry, can I just ask you, is it, is, is it because they purposefully did not want to, or was it because they were ignorant as to what their obligations were? Or it's, what? They're basic things like paying minimum wage. Like hmm. These are not... Um, Un, like, these are absolute basic requirements they of the job. Know. They got to know these things. These are these are absolute mandatory conditions. But when um, the ministry went even further and looked at vulnerable workers in broader areas, the non-compliance rate is between seventy and eighty percent. So when we talk about this being, um, you know, as Minsuk said, uh, not rotten apples, but a whole uh, system that is designed to encourage exploitation, to allow exploitation. It really is a systemic problem. And we, we've known about this for decades now. Um, it's, you know, we're at a point where we have to act. We can't pretend that this isn't the story anymore. Well, you've just said rotten apples. Let me ask about tomatoes. Because, uh, so, you know, Leamington's obviously the, uh, I think it's the capital in Canada of producing the best tomatoes yeah. anywhere. Is it the case, I mean, having looked at this, is it your view that the people of Canada simply want to get the cheapest price for a can of tomatoes that they possibly can, and they frankly don't give a damn about the rest of the story? I don't believe that of Canadians. 
I think Canadians believe in the vaunted values of human rights, social justice, that our country has in many ways benefited from internationally uh, as a country that stands for those values. I think the story of the labor injustice behind our tomatoes is untold. I believe now is a time for people to start making their concerns and voices heard because for the first time we have a federal government that's talking about a reform of this program, a program that in which widespread stories reports of abuse have happened for decades and for the first time migrant workers are marching to Ottawa on a historic caravan called Harvesting Freedom. They started off in Labor Day in September from Leamington, Ontario and they've been hitting every rural postal stop along the way and they will arrive on Thanksgiving weekend October 1st and 2nd in, in Ottawa to speak about their stories, uh, to critique the program and to bring the message home to Parliament Hill to really demand that this government finally take action and responsibility because this is a federal program. Mm -hmm. These workers were invited. They're guest workers. Well, they they're have said they're going to look at it. The federal government has they said they're going to look at it. They have said they're going to look at it. So now it's a time for TVO viewers, Canadian citizens, people who buy, I think, tomatoes that are subsidized by the labor and exploitation of migrant mm -hmm. workers to finally say, no, this is actually not okay. And therefore, the Canadian public should do what? Oh, well, one, we should hold our federal governments and our provincial governments responsible and accountable for changing this program. Workers who are here as migrant workers have no pathway to citizenship, no pathway to status. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to start asking, what is the role of migrant labor programs in Canada? How are they reconstructing who is a preferred citizen, who is a um, desirable citizen? So this is and all wrapped up in immigration as well. Absolutely. Labor programs yeah. and Im immigration are completely tied. Jen wanted to add. Mm -hmm. My, my view on immigration is that our immigration policies globally, not just Canada, but around the globe, have not kept pace with social evolution. We as societies have evolved and we have these ideals that we hold up, but our immigration policies have not evolved alongside that. And we're still acting like we're afraid to be overrun by what? I don't know but trying to keep people out as if they're undesirable except to come here to work for a limited time. But just so I'm clear, it, the, the people who come to this country under the temporary foreign worker program, do they do that with a view towards becoming a Canadian citizen someday? Some do. Some do. Many of, them, many of them are actually told that that's what is uh, is possible for them. That Who if tells you them work, that? The, um, the, it comes. That message comes from recruiters. That message comes from employers. Um, that it's a lure to bring people here, um, and they realize when they get here that that path doesn't exist. That they're um, here. That they're. Uh, here for their labor, but um, after they've been here for four years, they're shown the door. They, they have to leave. That, that the law requires them to leave, unless they're in the seasonal agricultural worker program, where they can come year after year for up to eight months a year, uh, with no end in sight. And no matter how long they work, they can't stay. There are some people in the program who've been working up to 46 out of the 50 years that that program has been running. There's fathers and sons who have been coming in that program for their entire adult who careers, no who have no right to stay to citizenship. and yeah. and we've created different industries where we've said that these are our zones that we're just going to staff them permanently with people who have no rights right mm. and that depresses the conditions in those industries it depresses the conditions generally it creates um, social it's socially corrosive um, and uh, but it's very much designed in order to deliver that kind of labor and what we see is um, that the more those zones of exceptionality are normalized, whether it's agriculture, whether it's caregiving, we see other industries saying, me too. So we've seen um, fish processing in the Maritimes saying, we want that program too. Yep. We've seen hospitality out west saying, we want it too, right? That we want to create uh, programs just like this. And the more that we hive off these zones where the terms of work, the conditions of work, are considered absolutely unacceptable and below standard for Canadian workers, we're depressing the system for everyone so and creating a two tier labor market. I, I presume you would urge not extending beyond the sectors where this currently exists? Absolutely. I think that what needs to happen is a return to a robust immigration system that gives people permanent status on uh, from the outset, which is what we have had for, for generations. That is um, how we've built 
the Canadian society that we hold out to the world. Um, and it's only very recently that this move to temporariness became the norm. That it is a very recent evolution uh, within the last 15 years. Um, but it is a sea change and we need to go back to um, permanent immigration mm. that allows workers from all classes, working class, middle class, um, and so on, all to have the right to to immigrate to Canada. Right now, as a working class worker, the only way you can come to Canada is with temporary status. So our immigration system is preferentially um, uh, in, uh, aligned with bringing um, uh, professional and uh, skilled trades people in on permanent status, but as a working class worker, um, there's no route other than temporariness. Minsook, what are the unions of this province doing in an attempt to either help organize or at least help ameliorate the situation? Well, unions are taking action alongside migrant workers and recognizing there's common cause. So United Food and Commercial Workers Union, UNIFOR, the Canadian Labour Congress have been working to build uh, support houses, to build educational campaigns, to identify that uh, the race to the bottom affects all of us. Uh, the story you have told has previously been, I think, a lot in the shadows. You are obviously with this documentary helping to get it out of the shadows. What do you hope happens? change. I think that this migrant labor program needs to be reviewed and understood as a program that's um, changing the immigration pathways into this country, not just around um, the kind of work you do, but there's a racialized dimension to this program. Most of the workers who come through the temporary foreign worker streams, whether you're under SOP as a live-in caregiver program, are uh, racialized bodies from the global south. And we're reconstructing... A little, a little translation necessary here. Well, racialized of, meaning people of color, black and brown bodies, who are coming here as desired as workers, but not uh, good enough to be citizens. And I think that's a critical problem when we start looking at who is a Canadian. Hmm. Jen, when you get together with your fellow farmers, with your fellow employers, and you talk about some of the issues that we've been discussing here at this table today, what comes up? A lot of defensiveness. Yeah. People don't, no, no employer believes that they are setting out to be racist or, or discriminatory or, um, you know, to treat people badly. I um, confess I don't really talk to a whole lot of other employers who are um, using the uh, Seasonal Agricultural Worker Program directly um, because I find myself at odds um, a lot of times in terms of my perspective. At odds in what way? Um, <laughs> the men who work on our farm are friends. We have them over for dinner. We have them over for a beer in the evening. Um, um, one of my workers recently went through uh, personal trouble and um, during that he came over to our house almost every evening. Um, just because he needed support and you know so that's the kind of relationship we have with them in the winter um, my husband and I go down and visit them um, spend time with them in their homes um, so this is in Jamaica for in example? Jamaica yeah okay. yeah so um, you think you have I mean I don't want to push this and say they're like family but it's not no I say that I say that and, and I'm, I, I I didn't say that because I don't it's it's too easy to throw words around like that and um, for it to sound disingenuous or, or, or fake, hmm. um, you know. But when you spend the hours that we do working towards the same goal, working long hours and um, sharing laughter and sharing uh, leisure time, you know, that relationship, that bond develops. Um, hmm. that's, that's a human thing. Um, What's your view on whether or not the people that you bring up here, for example, from Jamaica, um, in terms of immigration, in terms of citizenship, should they be, because they have done this kind of work, fast-tracked to be Canadian citizens? Most definitely. Look, these people have been, as, as Min Sook and, and Faye have said, coming for years. Um, one gentleman who uh, has now retired, when he came to us for the last couple of years of his um, uh, working career, he had uh, worked 35 years, I believe, on a fruit farm in Niagara. So what, eight months a year or six yeah. months? Yeah, eight months a year is eight the maximum. Eight months a year for um, 35 years. Yeah. 
Uh, he put his two children f through school. One became a police officer and one became a, a teacher. Um, and, you know, so that job did well for his family. However, even having spent his entire career, he is not eligible to simply immigrate. It should be, in my opinion, a checkbox, you know, and, and, and proof of employment, an ROE for heaven's sake. Um, yeah, you know, this person has contributed to Canadian society. Why shouldn't they be able to live here? Hmm. You know, um, and, and if I ask my workers, what would you like to see changed? Number one things that come up, the very top one is EI. They pay into it. They pay into employment insurance. They do. But and they cannot they, they ever claim. collect. Mm -hmm. Even we as employers don't have the right to keep them here. For example, um, uh, Neville, one of our, our uh, main guys, he arrived one year, a couple of years back, and about one week after he got here, uh, had to go to the hospital because he had acute appendicitis. Had his appendix out. And fortunately, his recovery was fairly quick. After a couple of weeks, he felt up to returning to work and, you know, light duty and, and, and all of that till he was fully. Um, but a Canadian worker would have had the option to spend longer if they required it. Again, fortunately, he is in relatively good health otherwise and recovered very quickly. But had he remained ill and unable to work, we would have been outside of the rules had we kept him here when he was not able to work beyond that two weeks. Gotcha. Uh, in our last minute here, Minsook, mm -hmm. I'd like to know, I'm, I'm certainly hoping that a lot of people stick around and watch the documentary yes. tonight that's going to be on immediately after this. What would you like them to take away from it? that we can actually make change now. Now is the time for change. This migrant labor program has got to be um, reviewed for the labor and human rights abuses. Workers cannot come in tied to employers. Um, citizenship cannot be dangled as a pathway to citizenship. Workers must be given uh, permanent status on arrival. The, the federal government has undertaken a review of the program and yep. they're releasing um, their recommendations on September 19th and what we have to be really attentive to is uh, that they're making a choice here. That they can either in this moment choose to continue with this program that entrenches exploitation or they can choose to change it so that people can have decent work, decent lives. Um, but we have to hold them accountable because they are making a choice and if you don't like the outcomes that you see and you'll see some fairly horrific outcomes that are normal in the film, if you don't like those outcomes now's the time to change it. I think we have tantalized people long yeah. enough. It's time to watch the documentary. Uh, in the meantime, Min Suk Lee, thank you very much for coming in here tonight. Faye Faraday, labor and human rights lawyer, visiting prof at Osgoode Hall Law School, and Jen Fenning. You were very brave to join this gathering today. This could have gone real south for you, but you did lovely. <laughs> uh, Director of Human Resources, Operations and Marketing at Fenning's Organic Farm in New Hamburg. Thanks, everybody. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.